Hello, and welcome back to the Sly 2 Any% speedrunning tutorial. In this fourth part, Beaver and I will cover Episode 3, The Predator Awakes. If you haven't already, go back and watch the previous parts since they contain information that is also relevant to this episode, and we will assume you already know. Let's get started. Coming from resetting the game for the Episode 2 outro, or watching the cutscene, mash to enter Episode 3. This episode, along with episodes 7 and 8, has an animated intro cutscene that is skippable if we reset the game. But again, it depends on your setup whether it's faster. Resetting to skip intros is not possible on PS2 or PS Vita. If resetting the game, begin holding down the PS button when you can see the entirety of the Sly Mask's eyes in the fade out animation. Your display may affect this cue slightly if the edges of the screen are chopped off. When menuing to reset, listen to ensure you heard the cutscene begin playing, even if it's for a brief moment. The start of the cutscene sounds like this. If you didn't hear anything, just close and reopen the PS menu. Resetting too early will result in the end of your run, as you'll be stuck in Cairo as Bentley, with no way out without cheat codes. This occurs when a file which was last saved or autosaved in the episode menu is loaded, when Cairo has been skipped. After the cutscene or the reset, we need to buy Stealth Slide. We hover Sly by default, and there are no other characters unlocked, so go one left to the thief net, then right to sell two treasures with one press each. Then go left and all the way to the bottom to buy Stealth Slide, which is the Sly gadget worth 650 coins. Exit the thief net and go right once to Sly, split for the start of the episode upon selecting him. Square boost off the left side of the safe house and hit square again in midair. Release R1 and equip Stealth Slide to your desired bind between L2, R2, and L1. L1 is strongly recommended. If you have Smoke Bomb, it'll be selected, so go one right first. On the ground, you should land right about here. Now let's talk about Stealth Slide, which will define our movement as Sly for the rest of the game. When the assigned button is pressed, Sly is immediately granted additional speed. Sly's unit speed, which represents speed values programmed into the game, jumps to 1000 at the first moment of Stealth Slide compared to his running speed of 832. When the button is released and the player has directional input, Sly instantly returns to normal speed. On flat ground with continuous use, stealth slide speed begins depreciating immediately at a rate of 100 units per second. It reaches running speed after 1.68 seconds of use on flat ground. So the earliest moments of stealth slide are when Sly is at his fastest, so we want to repeatedly refresh it. However, the initial press of stealth slide is also more expensive in terms of gadget meter or juice. Basically, there is a notable cost to start it, and then juice is steadily expended as you continue to hold after that. Matching stealth slide just burns the meter. When holding stealth slide downhill, Sly accumulates momentum, resulting in the possibility for some incredible speed, generally with no need to refresh until the ground evens out again. For the remainder of the run, unless we're literally right at the end of a job or a set of jobs, we want to always have juice. So ideal usage of Stealth Slide would maximize speed while also minimizing gadget meter usage. On flat ground, we can do this by pressing and holding Stealth Slide for 0.5 to 0.7 seconds, then release and immediately repeat. During shorter slide segments, we are allowed to be more liberal with gadget meter and use shorter beats of Stealth Slide. However, this does not inherently save any time, since scientific study indicates that pulses each lasting between 0.5 and 0.7 seconds achieve the max time save of the gadget on flat ground already. Repeated stealth slides lasting 0.7 seconds each equates to 86 beats per minute. Between each pulse, Sly moves at running speed. So although shorter bursts would more frequently return Sly to peak speed, he would also more frequently return to running speed. Still, some runners prefer to spam stealth slide during short segments. In some areas, quick pulses are objectively beneficial, since particular terrain can cut slide speed, and you want to renew it with a new stealth slide. Slide speed can also be cut within stealth slide by bonking on structures or guards. During longer slide segments, it's important to stretch out each pulse so that we don't ever find ourselves unable to use it when we'd like to. In a minute of movement on flat ground, stealth slide saves about 9 seconds compared to running, so this is very important. By square boosting during stealth slide, we can carry slide speed into what's called a stealth slide square boost. This can be done during a lengthier hold, or just with a very brief stealth slide usage, with the stealth slide at the same time as, or very shortly before, the square boost. Stealth slide square boosts almost completely replace the normal square boost we've been doing so far, with very few exceptions. 
and we'll use them at certain times even if a jump isn't necessary, just to keep speed for longer than we would on the ground, and or to travel quickly for a brief time without any meter being used. Like we discussed in part 1, square boost distance is dependent on speed, so stealth slide square boost travel farther. And, as was briefly mentioned in part 1, square in midair after a square boost preserves Sly's momentum for longer, since a downward cane swipe animation does not allow him to slow. Because there is more speed involved with Stealth Slide, these midair cane swings are more prominent with Stealth Slide, but this doesn't mean we'll do it every time. This mainly depends on terrain and altitude. Normal usage of Stealth Slide generally isn't beneficial when going uphill, since the speed dies instantly, but this isn't the case with Stealth Slide Square Boost. This generally makes them the optimal way to move uphill as Sly. Without directional input, Stealth Slide will propel Sly in the direction which the player last inputted. Usually, this is the same direction that Sly is facing. By directing the stick and beginning Stealth Slide at the same time, Sly is instantly granted speed in the desired direction, bypassing the turning animation that is required with running. Likewise, a Stealth Slide Square Boost instantly sends Sly where directed, with no need to get a running start. But, during Stealth Slide, Sly has a larger turn radius, so controlling him becomes more like steering, which becomes more difficult as Sly's speed increases. Outside of pickpocketing situations, don't release R1 while using Stealth Slide, since Sly returning to walking speed between usages will significantly lower his average speed. Stealth Slide is completely silent, and the brief time spent running in between proper beats isn't enough to make noise. R1 tapping is generally replaced by Stealth Slide, since what two or three R1 taps can do can be accomplished with a single tap of Stealth Slide. But sometimes it's fine or even better to use R1 tapping if you need to conserve meter or if the situation is scary. When Stealth Slide is ongoing, Sly can do a normal jump, but he can't pickpocket, use smoke bomb, open the binocucom, attack, or interact with things. Since Sly can't attack, this also means that you cannot begin a glitch high jump. Inputting both Stealth Slide and an attack on the same frame prioritizes the Stealth Slide. But Stealth Slide can be started during the animation of a cane swing or uppercut, and it instantly cancels the charge or spin from a charge attack. All in all, Stealth Slide is an extremely useful gadget for utility as well as speed, and will use it constantly. A lot of using it just comes from feel, so if you're new to running Slide 2 or new to using Stealth Slide, just get comfortable with using it first. The intricacies will come with time and practice. So, when we enter Episode 3, by Stealth Slide, Square Boost left off the safe house and equip it. Then Stealth Slide Square Boost over the gap. Hold Stealth Slide for a moment and then Square Boost without releasing it until you're mid-air. Or, press Stealth Slide at the same time as your Square Boost. From this point onward in the series, if we just say square boost, assume we mean a stealth slide square boost, unless we specifically say otherwise. Follow this route to the job trigger with pulses of stealth slide. You don't need to worry about juice at all in this job, since it's so short, so you can be very liberal with stealth slide. For the sake of GSM, turn your camera slightly to the left between the gap and reaching the stone floor. Although insignificant in terms of angle, this is very consistent at preventing a bad guard near the trigger. After passing through the archway, square boost and spam square into the trigger. After the cutscene, we will have this camera angle, and we need to wrap around toward the waterfall. Hold back left and immediately resume stealth sliding. If there's a flashlight guard looking at you in the cutscene, hold just left of 6 o'clock on the left stick, and also hold stealth slide, square, and X during the final moments of the cutscene. This will buffer a stealth slide square boost on the first frame after the cutscene, which should help you escape unscathed. Buffering a stealth slide square boost is possible by holding out of Binocucom cutscenes and in a few other instances. Swing in case of snake spawns and again to break the stone thing. Square boost through the waterfall to cut the corner and again to cross the gap. Spam circle in front of the lever and again after the animation. Inside, after the cutscene, you'll randomly get one of two possible camera angles. Regardless, immediately single jump to atop this barrel, then glitch high jump to attach and slide on this vine. This skips the entirety of this room and even a cutscene. If you super sneaky to the spinning rail walks in the water, you can glitch high jump back to the main level directly or off the broken pillar. Or go across the room on the rail walks and climb the vine. If the barrel breaks and you still need to get up, kill the snake and use this. Once to the proper vine, slide normally and initiate a charge attack to detach. Mash stealth slide to cancel the charge and replace it with stealth slide. In this animation, Sly will walk and then attach to the ladder, but we can skip some of his walking by carrying momentum into the trigger with a square boost. From the animation, mash R3 to immediately open the binocucom, but make sure to not mash for too long or you'll close it. Zoom in and take a picture of the suspended half of the heart. 
Then look left and a little down while zooming to get Rajan. Then get the entrance in the backdrop left of him. You don't have to zoom in very much to take the entrance, but you do have to pan a little bit first. And finally pan then zoom to get the winch controls on the bottom left. That completes the job. Reset the game to skip a Bentley slideshow. After the reset, mash to select Sly again for freeing the elephant. Square boost off the left side of the safe house, then square boost across the gap. Double jump cane swing to hit the trigger from below. This job and the one following are both very movement intensive, although water bug run is much shorter. Make sure to stretch out your pulses of stealth slide so we still have juice remaining. From the cutscene, hold up left and stealth slide toward the higher right vine. Attach to it with a glitch high jump once past the road. Near the top, double jump off to the right and then single jump to the slope on the tree. Glitch high jump and attach again to the higher right vine. It's optimal to do a square boost, but this is tricky with the angle and camera perspective and it's rather easy to overshoot the tree. Near the top of the vine, double jump to detach, run at the plant, and spam circle. When detaching from climbable objects, it's optimal to do it as soon as possible, so pay attention to how early you can jump and still make it to the top cleanly. Ensure you don't press circle before Sly lands on the tree, or else you attach to a vine. After the first spice plant, hold upright from the animation and spam stealth slide and circle. Sly should burst off the treetop and attach to slide toward the roof of the safe house. During each plant animation, Sly will be facing the same direction which he will face afterwards, which you can use as a cue if you forget. From the vine, square boost to land on the roof. This is just a normal square boost and preserves the vine sliding speed. Be careful to not begin the square boost too late or you'll bonk and fall off. If this happens, you can glitch high jump from the mouth of the safe house to ledge grab this branch, and then glitch high jump to the roof. On the roof, square boost onto the slightly elevated section onto the plant, which also kills the snake if it spawns. Square boost off the roof and spam circle to attach to the vine. If you mess up the square boost to the slightly elevated section, you can double jump and attach to the vine from the lower portion. From the vine, glitch high jump up right to grab the climbable vine near where it bends to the left. Climb and double jump to get to the plant. Jumping to this vine is finicky since it's really easy to get super sneaky to the sliding vine. But if you're struggling, you can exaggerate moving to the right to put Sly where he can only connect to the correct vine. If you fall to the ground near the second plant before getting it, you can just use the bouncy mushroom and double jump to the sliding vine. Optimally, you would use a quad jump here, which saves a very small amount over a glitch high jump. A quad jump is a variation on the glitch high jump, which adds a circle input between the second X input and the appearance of the dust cloud. After pressing square to hold it, you have 23 frames to press X, X, and circle. The circle input gives Sly a small amount of additional height as part of his thief move animation, but it's then cancelled by the charge attack. After the dust cloud, to finish the quad jump, double jump just like with a standard glitch high jump. Quad jumping can be done over any rail walk, rail slide, or spire point, but it's only useful at a few specific points in the run for minor optimizations, so this isn't a required technique to learn. From the second plant animation, hold up and slightly left, and stealth slide square boost immediately, or stealth slide off the edge of the tree. With both options, cane swipe repeatedly to the ground. Do a few quick pulses of stealth slide and then hold to coast down the hill. Steer Sly and square boost onto the low roof. You have to fight hard against Sly's momentum to aim him to the left. Continue and square boost down onto the bouncy mushroom. Cane swing over the spice plant to grab it. When bouncing off the mushroom, you can double jump toward the tree immediately in an attempt to bonk off it and cut your upwards momentum. But if you bonk too hard, you won't make it to the top. This tree bonk is tricky and only saves frames, so feel free to ignore this. Our route after the third spice plant will be dependent on whether or not we do tusk jump. The optimal route holds back left from the spice plant animation and square boost off the edge of the trunk, spam circle to attach to the vine, and immediately double jump off to the upper level. Alternatively, you might find it more comfortable to hold directly back from the animation and move onto the branch before square boosting back left. The camera angle out of the animation is really awkward, and it'd be really slow to turn it around, so if you're struggling with this backward square boost, just cane swipe off the edge of the trunk, then double jump or glitch high jump to the vine. This would also be the backup for missing the square boost. For tusk jump, do a glitch high jump from the edge and wrap around the tusk to land on top. This jump is rather precise, and you'll of course fall into the water if you miss it. Avoid standing too near the lowest part of the tusk, or directing Sly into it, since you'll bonk immediately after jumping and won't be able to make it. If you recognize this happened, try to pull back in midair and land back on ground. On the tusk, stealth slide and square boost to the bridge, then square boost twice to reach the lower roof. Optimally, you square boost instead to the far side of the tusk so that when you spam square, you slide down the slope without ever landing. 
This will preserve horizontal momentum while also bringing slide to the ground quicker. Continue on the lower roof and square boost on the left side of the structure. Then glitch high jump to the next level. Direct slide a bit to the left and cut right to ensure you don't bonk. On this level, the route converges with the alternative. The optimal route only saves a second and a half, so if you're struggling with tusk jump, hold up left and stealth slide off the tree with the third spice plant. Square boost to cut the corner and then continue over the bridge. Line yourself up directly with the first spear and run onto it normally. After a few steps, do a stealth slide square boost and spam circle to attach to the next spear. Begin a charge attack to detach once you've landed. If your square boost consistency is a concern, you can just cross the spears normally. If you follow the jungle floor, head to the left and climb this vine. With this backup, it'd be faster to switch the movement from the tusk jump route. Then square boost onto the bouncy mushroom and double jump forward to the next level. The square boost is not required to bounce since with some mushrooms, you can just move into them from the ground. But this alternative route already uses quite a bit more stealth slide, so take the opportunity to conserve some. The two routes approach the stairs from different angles, but square boost over the tree and again immediately. In addition to going uphill optimally, the square boost prevents Sly from getting stuck on the stairs. Near the top, double jump to land on the second tier of this ruined archway. Glitch high jump to the top level. Direct Sly into the air instead of directly over the archway, to avoid landing on one of the steps. From the edge, glitch high jump diagonally to attach to the vine. This jump is easier with a running start. If you find it difficult, aiming for the brick on the cliffside rooftop may help you, but an optimal angle aims slightly more left to end up higher on the vine. Because of the vine's angle, you also can't aim too high. Glitch high jump to the branch, and spam circle as you approach the plant with running. If you land high enough on the vine, it's possible to make it to the branch with just two jumps, which should be done with the first two jumps of a glitch high jump. Sly will be facing down the vine, and a normal double jump would preserve that backwards facing angle, whereas a glitch high jump turns Sly around in midair at the time of the charge attack. Also, if you see you need a third jump to make it, this way you have it available. Or, you can double jump and reattach to the vine, and then signal jump off to the plant, but this is a tiny bit slower. Here are the routes to the fourth plant in full. From the animation, hold up left and stealth slide off and attach, then glitch high jump to grab the vertical vine. Double jump near the top to get to the roof. You can also quad jump here to get slightly higher in the vine. Optimally, you would use what is called a slope jump on this branch, and then square boost to the roof. This is an advanced optimization, but slope jumping in general is a technique we will use again. Like how a charge attack is able to grant Sly a grounded state in midair, it can also do so against a slope that's normally too steep for Sly to stand or jump from. Position Sly in front of a slope and turn his back to it, which can be done quickly and without moving him by tapping down on the d-pad. Then do essentially the same inputs as a glitch high jump toward the slope. You only need to do two X inputs, but additional ones don't affect anything. Once Sly's charge attack activates, Release square to spin, which allows you to climb. If Sly's charge attack is activating in midair and you're just doing a glitch high jump, you're likely standing too far from the slope or you're facing toward it. Shortly after the end of the spin, Sly would begin falling down the slope like he's supposed to, but you can chain slope jumps back to back to climb higher with each one, or you can do a normal jump or a glitch high jump immediately after the end of the spin. The timing for this can be tricky to learn, but it becomes quite comfortable after some practice. A slope jump can also be initiated with just a single X input, but this has a slightly different effect. In episode 3, we will exclusively use double jump slope jumps, but it can be advantageous to use a single jump in some places, as it's a trick which is heavily dependent on the terrain. There are a multitude of spots where Sly can slope jump throughout the game, but there are currently only 5 in the any% percent route. Only one of these, which is done rip off the ruby, saves a substantial amount of time and would be considered a required trick. For the slope jump and frame the elephant, hold up left from the animation and run on the branch to the elbow where it turns upwards. Face slide toward the camera, do a double jump slope jump, and immediately stealth slide square boost to the right after getting ground. Here we abuse stealth slide's ability to cancel a charge attack to gain free movement earlier. The branch is narrow and slippery, which makes running and setting up the slope jump difficult. The angle of the slope is not the most forgiving, so it's really easy to find yourself standing too far away from the slope and just glitch high jumping. 
This slope jump is pretty precise and saves less than two seconds, so we strongly recommend the traditional movement with climbing the vine. From the roof, square boost to attach to the vine. It's optimal to cut the corner significantly, but this is risky since you'll fall all the way down if you miss your square boost. So alternatively, you can get closer to the vine where you can square boost along its path and still be able to latch even if you miss the square boost. From the vine, use a charge attack to detach onto the tree. Our next bit of movement is a little tricky, so be careful if you get a spin attack coming off the vine. The spin attack is the same speed as Stealth Slide's starting speed, so it's fast, and the additional unexpected speed can surprise you and mess you up. The next plant is located on the tree in front of us and slightly below, and we can get there from the branch on this tree with a glitch high jump or a square boost. The faster method is of course the square boost, but again risks falling a long way. You also have to avoid bonking on the first branch, although it can be recovered. Much of the jump is done blindly, but you can see the desired tree from the first one to help line yourself up. After you land, run at the plant and spam circle. Optimally, this square boost is lined up with the trunk and you cane swipe down after the square boost, but this increases the precision and risk. Not cane swiping allows you to adjust slide midair after the square boost concludes and to land pretty much anywhere on the branch. It also allows slide a ledge grab if you're just slightly off, which he can't do during a cane swipe. For the glitch high jump, all of the same information applies, but it's a lot easier. Make sure to extend your jump at least a bit. This jump also has a very beginner friendly option in running on the branch for a few steps, glitch high jumping forward and slightly to the right, and spamming circle. If you see or hear Sly attach, you got it. Single jump off the vine upon landing. If you fall, super jump to the river to back it up. If you set grounded below, you'd have to do a large amount of platforming to get back. From the fifth plant animation, hold right and slightly back and double jump to attach to the vine. Repeatedly double jump and attach until you're able to glitch high jump or double jump to the tower. It's slightly faster to square boost onto the vine instead, but it's tricky because it's done blindly and requires holding a somewhat precise direction. On the tower, avoid bonking and square boost onto the vine. Rail slide briefly and square boost to the tree. Delay the second square boost if you miss the first. If square boosting is uncomfortable and you don't want to do the second square boost, just slide and single jump when close enough. From the final plant animation, hold back right and stealth slide square boost to land in front of the bridge or on it. Coast on the bridge, then pull stealth slide quickly and spam circle to interact with the elephant's feed bag. For the square boost, don't spam square if you're not confident you'll land on solid ground. Be careful with a guard spawn on the bridge, as it's surprisingly easy to bonk off him and fall into the water. This completes the job. We'll head to Waterbug Run from here. From the drop complete, hold up left to head toward the left side of the archway. Optimally, you would glitch high jump to one step below the top and then single jump to the top. If you ledge grab the step, it's possible to reach the top with a double jump, but you'll often just ledge grab again. If you can't consistently complete this without a single ledge grab, you can easily glitch high jump to two steps from the top and then double jump. On top, glitch high jump and press circle while moving toward the clue bottle to attach to the vine. This vine is attached to the platform above, which leans back and forth on a cycle which is just over 7.5 seconds long. At a specific point in the cycle, Sly will be unable to attach, but this is rather brief, so if Sly fails to grab the vine, just land on the bottle and do a neutral glitch high jump right away to attach. The platform cycle is global and begins when loading into the safe house before freeing the elephant. On the platform, glitch high jump and swing to hit the trigger. If on a cycle where the platform is shifting to lean towards us, it's possible to jump straight up and land in the trigger directly. Since we want to be on the roof, this saves some time on movement later. In this case, it's acceptable and typical to get a Banakikam animation, and ending up on the roof is the priority over skipping the animation. It's possible to both end up on top and skip the animation, but this is precise and cycle dependent. After the cutscene, if not on the roof, run around and glitch high jump to grab the vine, then hop up to get the bug. Just ignore the guard if there's one there. On certain cycles, you can glitch high jump to the roof directly, or do so from the starting position after the cutscene. But if you're on the roof, run to the right and grab the bug. Like Bug Dimitri's office, we have to complete this job without taking any damage. Although the game wants us to use pools along the way, we can just blitz to Rajan's office. For the optimal route, get the bug and drop down to the platform. Square boost across the river to land on the ground. With Stealth Slide, you can make the square boost at any point in the cycle. If you miss the square boost, spam circle and attach to one of the thief move objects in the river, and return to solid ground as soon as you can. After swinging at a possible snake, coast down the slope and through the fountain section. Square boost when the ground goes back up to keep the speed for longer. When the ground begins to slope back down, glitch high jump to climb the vine. 
This section has variability in terms of its guard spawns, which means you need to be able to read and react to where they are. In this game, flashlight guard shots are almost impossible to dodge in the open. It's important to not panic and just move quickly past any guards in a way that does not get you spotted from a flashlight guard in a proximity where they can hit you. Adjust lines and movement if necessary. This is a section that can become incredibly comfortable with some experience. A scenario where you are spotted but aren't in true peril of being hit is beneficial since it will prevent additional flashlight guard spawns until the guards lose you. If it doesn't seem like you can cruise past without being spotted in a dangerous proximity, it's an option to go behind a guard and hit them to knock them out, but this depends on the situation. In the area with the snake, if it's really needed, you could also just bail on this route and use the alternative, which we'll show in a moment. Beginning at the uphill terrain, if Sly isn't spotted, the guards behind us will start to despawn and respawn in front of us. A guard spawn you'd specifically like to avoid is one coming towards Sly in this area, creating a choke point near the rope. Pretty much any other position is either a good spawn or you can get around them. From the snake pit until the flat ground before the checkpoint, you can optionally GSM toward the ground, which is what Beaver does. Ideally you would turn the camera backward, but doing this movement backwards is pretty hard and also unnecessary since there's an easier option that's very consistent. After 13.76 seconds have elapsed since you grabbed the bug, it will start chirping, which will attract nearby guards. So it's important to do the next section relatively cleanly and quickly. If you can't consistently do that, you may want to opt for the alternative route. Before jumping up, ensure you aren't in danger of a flashlight guard. In extremely rare instances, you might have to wait a moment for the guard to move. Square boost to cut the corner onto the stairs, and again up them. Single jump to atop this brick, then glitch high jump to grab the top of the brick pillar in the corner. Jump slightly out from the wall, and then curl toward the pillar over the course of your glitch high jump. You can also reach the ledge grab from the pot nearby the top of the stairs, but this is harder and saves less than half a second compared to the brick. And for safety reasons, it's better that you never miss the jump to the ledge grab, so we recommend the brick. Sometimes the brick can be broken by a glitch high jump, so for a backup, there is this large stone to get to the bridge. You can also get a ledge grab on the wall sneak, which provides more cover, but again, you don't want to need a backup here. On the upper level, single jump onto the tree, on or just to the right of the dark spot in its texture, and then either double jump or glitch high jump to the roof. A glitch high jump makes avoiding a ledge grab very easy, whereas a double jump is a bit more precise but slightly faster. On the roof, once beyond the tree, spam circle to interact with the door. You can interact with the door all the way back here, but if you start mashing too early, you may leave the bug behind in the pool. The alternative route for this job is not necessarily easier, but it is a lot safer and more consistent because it avoids guard hotspots. It loses less than 2 seconds, but optimizations can make it lose less than a second. On the lower level of the starting platform, square boost towards the left side of the building with the tower. Be careful to not go too far to the left because of the water. Glitch high jump up and square boost across, or alternatively, you can just glitch high jump and attach to the rope. Square boost onto the stone, and then glitch high jump to the next level. This rooftop is the one area on this route where a flashlight guard could spawn, but the risk is very low. On the next level, square boost onto the tree root, then glitch high jump to grab the rope. The cane swing from the square boost can make it easy to slip off the root, so you can alternatively single jump. Then glitch high jump from the rope to ledge grab the roof. With the well-timed quad jump, you can get to the roof without a ledge grab, saving just over a half second. On the roof, we need to slope jump to the top of this structure. Get close to the slope or just run into it and then tap down on the deep head so that slide turns his back to it. We can get to the top with a double jump slope jump followed by a normal single jump. Hold square and then press X twice back to back, just like the start of a glitch high jump, while moving into the slope. Once the charge attack animation appears, release square to spin up and then press X shortly after the spin concludes. If you struggle with the timing of the single jump, you can alternatively just mash X out of the slope jump to get a double jump. Remember that with a double jump slope jump, additional X inputs don't have an effect. So doing the same inputs as a glitch high jump would work fine, as long as you're positioned properly. This slope jump can be optimized further by using a tap of stealth slide to cancel the charge attack and then double jumping. From the top of the structure, square boost off, then wrap to the left and enter the office. You can hit any guards on this roof, but be wary of their get up attack if you happen to hit them near your own path. Once in Rajan's office, exit the entryway upright, square boost onto the desk and spam circle to interact with the pool. Taking damage here would respawn us back at the beginning of the job, but this section is really easy so don't be scared. If you miss the square boost or end up beside the desk, just go around the desk to the right. This completes the job. Load the game after it.
From the load, Halligan select left to Bentley and head right. To the left of the far right tooth, there's a gap which we can easily run through, but avoid bonking on the tooth to the left of the gap. Drop two bombs on the way down. Run off right of the tree with another bomb. Turn the camera around for GSM and use the road to guide you onto the bridge. At the top, you can turn your camera back to normal. Single jump onto the tree, right onto a dark spot, and double jump to the roof. Single jump onto the mushroom and bounce up. This movement can be optimized by dropping a bomb after each of the single jumps. In the case of the mushroom jump, doing so can allow you to spend very little time in the air before it bounces you. On the tree, stand on the bend in this branch or just to the right of it. At ground level, just before the water, there is a wall sneak which will later be used to get to spice grinder destruction. In this game, if you attach to a wall sneak in midair and then press X shortly before landing, your jump will return you to your previous elevation rather than give you a standard jump height. So we can abuse this to get to the large bridge with the job trigger. From the branch, face toward the right half of the pillar supporting the bridge. For beginners, you could even enter the binocucom to line it up more carefully if you'd like and either walk or run off the side holding forward. In the air, press circle so that Bentley magnets to the wall sneak, which is indicated by the shift in his animation. Then press X shortly before Bentley reaches the ground. Delay your double jump to reach the bridge. The double jump timing is not precise, but it can't be immediate, which is why you need to time the first X input instead of mashing. If you miss the launch, you can quickly jump into the water to hopefully return to the tree. This area seems to be pretty generous with not updating grounding position. If you are too far left and ledge grab on the roof above the wall sneak, you can save it by retrying with a jump from the ledge. Being too far left can also cause Bentley to bonk on the side of the building with the wall sneak. The alternative to this trick requires running all the way around, so everyone should do it. Take a little bit of time setting it up if you need. For the job trigger cutscene, we can perform the biggest skip of the run so far outside of Cairo. For this, we need greater than one quarter health, since we need to take damage from the water. If you have one quarter or less, just run into the job trigger. To skip the cutscene, first stand here, a few steps from the trigger and also very near, if not exactly, where you land from the launch. Begin holding the PS button, walk about two steps, and single jump into the job trigger. After about a second of holding, the menu will appear just like when we go to reset. Before it does, ensure Bentley ends up inside of the job trigger. In the menu, hold select and triangle at the same time, then press circle once while continuing to hold. On Korean, the gadget menu will appear and we will hear a buzzing sound. When it's closed, Bentley will drop a bomb and he will be in the job trigger without having activated it. Bentley is allowed to enter this trigger if select and triangle are pressed in the same frame when he's inside. The PlayStation menu is able to buffer inputs, so we hold the buttons out of the menu to very easily input both on the first frame that the game resumes. On non-Korean versions, the trick works the exact same way, but the gadget menu will not appear, since the triangle input closes the gadget menu before you even see it. If Bentley lands on the ground before the PS menu appears, the cutscene will play. If you feel that this will happen, you can double jump in the trigger to try to extend your airtime. If Bentley is not in the trigger at all when the menu appears, close the menu and double jump to try to avoid it, and restart the setup. If he isn't in the trigger and you attempt the buffer, he will just activate the cutscene from the bomb drop. When learning this trick, people sometimes find the timing on the PS menu hold to be difficult, but you don't even need to time it to when you enter the trigger. By holding the button from the proper starting position, walking just a couple steps, and then single jumping, it's very easy to consistently end up within the trigger when the menu appears. Use the very simple movement beginning once you hold to time everything for you. Since we need to be able to jump while firmly holding the PS button, it's practically required to use claw grip for this trick with either index finger on the PS button. If you see the in-game X and B appear as if you just press the PS button, you are likely reducing pressure on it to the point where it no longer registers that you're holding. Ending up in the trigger allows us to set our grounded position in it, double jump and then do two super jumps on the bridge, and fall down onto the waterfall. Depending on how far you travel on the bridge, you may only need to double jump after one of the super jumps to make it to the waterfall. Unlike Sly with his cane swing, there's no way to buffer super jumps as Bentley, so you need to just time the X input within a few frames before Bentley lands on the ground. It is highly recommended to time the jumps rather than mashing, since mashing is far less consistent and is more difficult to do. Make sure you time the input to very shortly before Bentley lands on the ground. Since you can run freely inside the trigger, you can run for a few steps to begin the super jump chain from the right side of it. This places you near enough the waterfall that it's possible to make it there with one fewer super jump, using two delayed double jumps. 
This is the optimal movement, but it's important to choose whatever is most comfortable, since mistakenly falling in the river will place you in the cutscene. If you mess up a super jump, just restart the setup by buffering into the job trigger again. This area on the shallow water does not set ground in position. Run and single jump onto this ledge, then double jump to land on this broken railing. Neither of these positions will update grounded, but landing on the roof will. If you slip off, you can try to mash X and hopefully get a super jump. From the railing, double jump to the brick. Here we need to throw a trigger bomb to overlap with the spot where Rajan will spawn when the job begins. Aim it as far away as possible and a bit to the left of the door. There is a crack in the ground right at the proper spot. Unlike with other trigger bomb uses, don't stress too much about lining up Bentley before pressing the button to aim. Due to the brick's small size, there's a high risk of slipping off, so it's fine to just swivel Bentley in the aiming mode before tossing. This brick does update our position, so we need to destroy it so that the game can't return us here, and we'll instead use our previous position within the job trigger. Do the same inputs as a glitch high jump to break the brick and double jump to the railing at the same time. At certain angles this won't work, but it isn't precise. If the brick doesn't break, just jump back and try again. Alternatively, you can drop a normal bomb, which is impossible to mess up. From the railing, single jump or double jump to land in the narrow width of the waterfall. After hitting the water, mash triangle through the warp, and we skip the cutscene. There's a lot going on here, so let's break it down. First, we buffer into the job trigger to set our grounded position inside it. Then, we super jump or use spots that don't update position to throw a trigger bomb at Rajan's spawn location. After breaking the brick, jumping into water returns us to our position in the trigger. The warp respawns Bentley in midair, so we mash triangle to start the job immediately. The job trigger is outside the range of the trigger bomb, so it automatically detonates. Simultaneously, Rajan spawns on top of the bomb. The damage to Rajan triggers a job fail screen, which allows us to skip the cutscene. If at some point in the lower level, you are sure you set grounded position, you have to return to the top and restart with the setup. Using this ruin, it's possible to reach the wall sneak above, but the double jump from the first tier to the top of the ruin is rather precise to avoid bonking. The alternative to this backup would be either returning to the tree and redoing the launch to the bridge, or just running up the casual way in this direction. When retrying the skip when the brick has been broken, you can do one additional super jump to get from the shallow water onto the narrow railing along the stairs, and throw the trigger bomb from there. Then return to the shallow water and run to the river or waterfall to complete the skip. On the bridge, if there's a flashlight guard which poses a threat, sleep dart them before entering the trigger. A guard creates the risk of getting shot into water, which would send you back into the trigger too soon. Or, a guard could stand near enough the trigger to block your respawn back to it, since we can't return to a grounded position in the immediate vicinity of a guard. Keep in mind that the buffer into the job trigger drops a bomb, which makes noise and can lure a guard toward the trigger. However, it seems to be probable that the guard would move on before you finish the skip. Here is the launch to the bridge and the skip done in one motion. Feel free to take some time to be careful in certain parts of this, especially on the buffer into the trigger. Optimally, the saves run 31 seconds in Korean and about 36.5 in other languages. It also makes the remainder of the job easier and more consistent due to the reload resetting guards. For the buffer into the job trigger to work, it is essential that you don't re-enter the safe house and exit again, so if you select the wrong character at the beginning of the job, load the game and try again. On platforms other than PS3, the lack of a PS menu means that you can't buffer the inputs to enter the trigger, so we recommend doing the original setup instead, which grounds beside the trigger and is pushed into it via a bomb dropped in the river. In the description, we have linked This Is Not Jake's full tutorial on this setup. It is difficult, but it is a totally viable setup, which was regularly used in runs before the PS menu buffer was found. Once you hit the skip, mash X through the job fail screen. In this job, we need to lure Rajan with sleep darts to three different watermelons. Being spotted by Rajan at any point will fail the job. Being spotted by guards will not, but it will attract Rajan's attention and lead him toward you. During the mask fade-in, Bentley can't fire darts, so hold upright and run for a few steps. Fire a sleep dart as soon as you can. We are aiming for this area on the roof of the temple, just above the building we use to enter Rajan's office. It's important that the dart hits the rounded roof, since this position lures Rajan directly to the watermelon with only a single dart. If you shoot too low and it connects to the building, Rajan won't be lured all the way, so fire another dart at the roof spot to lead him the rest of the way. Our speed in much of this job is based purely on how well we lead Rajan, and that comes down to our darts and the timing of them. 
Since Bentley's crossbow takes two seconds to reload, it's important to aim accurately and at the proper time. After the dart, run to fall down and meet Rajan at the watermelon. In the animation where Rajan eats it, we want to be in a spot where we can very quickly grab the blueprint afterward, but we also can't drop down too soon or else Rajan will see us. During the melon animations in this job, note Bentley's facing angle, since that will determine the direction to hold coming out of it. Depending on your position, you may not need to move, but always hold R1 in a direction just in case. Mash circle to grab the blueprint. Also take note of guards, since their position and facing angle vary. If a guard is facing toward you during the melon animation, it would be safer to sleep dart them before grabbing the blueprints, since they would attract attention afterward. Grabbing the blueprints freezes guards and also makes them lose you, so dealing with the guard before the blueprint is better. After each print, Rajan can't hear anything for a period of about five and a half seconds until he begins moving, so we can just run away. But for the sake of safety and consistency, we'd prefer to not be spotted by guards on the route to the second watermelon. So you may want to R1 tap due to a nearby guard that's facing away. Keep the camera pointed back toward Rajan and run off the upper level to the right of the brick. Single jump to exit the pool and click the left stick to see Rajan's waypoint. Fire a dart at this spot along the side of the waterfall the moment you see the waypoint move. With experience, you can gain a feel for this timing, but we recommend relying on the visual cue. Firing a dart too early is really bad, because the reload time will make the next dart too late, so Rajan will take an asinine route to follow it. After the first dart, run a few steps back in this direction and fire another dart at the ground here. Continue backward and fire another at this spot at the lip in the ground and then continue to beyond the watermelon and fire a dart on the close side of it. Stand and wait behind the watermelon farm. He won't see you unless you stand incredibly close to it. It does seem to be possible that for the final dart you can fire it too soon, so it's recommended to wait until Rajan is on the ground at the spot of the previous dart before firing the final one. If there's a guard on the ground from one of the middle two darts, it's especially important to shoot the final one on the close side of the watermelon or even exaggerate its placement, so that it only overlaps with Rajan's listening range and not the guard's, since Rajan has a larger listening range. It is faster by less than a half second to lure Rajan to the second watermelon by being alerted, but it's not recommended to do this on purpose. If you are spotted, continue with the same movement, but you can usually skip at least the first two darts. Flashlight guards are usually too far away to pose a serious problem, but you want to snipe rooftop guards before they get closer. Be prepared to lure Rajan normally if he and the guards lose you in the latter half of the route. Before grabbing the second blueprint, ensure there's no nearby guards which will spot you afterward, and definitely sleep dart them if there are. One of the goat guards possible attacks is a laser rod which will travel horizontally across a massive distance, and if this connects with Rajan, you will fail the job. There isn't much you can do about this except avoid getting spotted. From the animation, run back left and head backwards into the tunnel. Shoot a dart at the base of the small slope just before entering. Continue backwards toward the bridge and shoot a dart at this door. Then continue onto the bridge and fire the final dart at the top right corner of this building. This lures Rajan across the river to the final melon. Again, we can't shoot before Rajan's waking up animation completes and he starts to move. But you can use your movement to time this for you. For the other darts, use Rajan's waypoint to confirm each one works. During the second melon and blueprint animations, it's very important to pay attention to the tunnel since a flashlight guard will frequently spawn in the area past it and he poses a serious problem for the route to the third watermelon. If there is a guard or a light visible, direct the camera toward the left to look at the temple. Guard spawns favor particular areas and pointing the camera in this direction targets the safe ones available from this perspective. Since the game will only have two flashlight guards at a time in normal situations, you know that there won't be a guard beyond the tunnel if you see two or can get a second one to spawn. Simply having the camera pointed this way does not guarantee this, so you have to actually look and be aware. For despawning the guard beyond the tunnel, I felt that running slightly to the left helps instead of keeping an optimal line. We'd theorize that this has to do with the amount of time the game is given where it can respawn the guard somewhere else. In the tunnel, you have to keep the camera directly backwards or it will get stuck. If you are still unsure if the guard is beyond the tunnel, listen for sneaking sounds and or check for an indicator on the health bar. If he's there, turn and sleep dart him. This should be outside of Rajan's listening range, but watch his waypoint to confirm. Even if you didn't see a guard in the animation, it may be a good idea to do the GSM anyways. This is a job where you very much want to avoid a disaster because one can erupt very easily. 
If you are alerted on the way to the third watermelon, there's no good backup and you'll have to just desperately run away from Majan and hope he doesn't see you. This jump to the rooftop exists, but it's relatively precise and would be terrifying when under pressure from Rajan. If you're spotted here, it would also be unlikely that you can do the animation skip, which is called Melon Skip. By holding triangle and mashing circle beside Rajan when he reaches a watermelon, we can pull the blueprints immediately. For the first two melons, the animation where Rajan eats the melon and falls asleep will just play afterwards. But if we do it on the final melon, the game recognizes we have three blueprints and proceeds to the ending cutscene skipping the melon animation and saving over 11 seconds. After firing the final dart to the top right corner of the building, run to the mushroom and single jump to bounce up to the roof. If you just hold neutral until over the roof and then move forward to land on it, without exaggerating how far you go, you can stand safely without Rajan seeing you. This is not as scary as it looks, since the game is quite forgiving here. Hold triangle and mash circle until Bentley grabs the blueprints. To do this skip, you want to make sure you fire the final dart from a position where you can make it to the roof before Rajan reaches the melon. If the timing for meeting Rajan on the roof is really tight, you can begin holding triangle while in midair. Bentley will continue to hold the bomb as long as you hold the button. If you are too late but you have already held triangle, Bentley will drop a bomb, which can damage Rajan and fail the job in the melon animation. If Rajan's been led off his desired path due to being spotted or a bad dart, the skip may not be possible or safe, since it relies on him approaching the melon from a certain angle where he won't see you. But if Rajan leaps up to the building from across the river to the left of the waterfall, you should be good to go. It's very slightly faster for the third melon to send your second dart to this structure instead of the doorway, but this tightens up the timing on doing melon skip, so we recommend the other option for comfort. If you fail the job at any point, you'll keep your blueprint progress, but will respawn at the position of the job trigger. You can lure him to the second watermelon like this. And you can lure him to the third watermelon like this. Collecting the third blueprint completes the job. Reset the game to skip a Bentley slideshow. After the reset, mash to select Bentley again for Blow the Dam. The movement is mostly the same as leading Rajan. In the tunnel, stick to the right, and then turn and keep right of the mushroom, single jump and run into the trigger. This is another turret job, so all the same principles from Battle the Chopper in Episode 2 apply here. Again, we have the option of the mashing strat, or the slower but easier hold and release strat. However, we don't need to aim, so our heat management is the sole thing which defines how quickly we can play this. Don't ever touch the sticks at all, and the turret will stay pointed at the dam. Ignore the helicopters, you should never be at risk of dying. When the dam's health bar on the right side is nearing empty, you can let the heat meter fill if it means firing your final shots earlier. After the job completes, load the game. Halligan select right to slide for spice grinder destruction, and square boost off upright landing in this platform. Glitch high jump to the spire point, then do a curled glitch high jump up to the top. Optimally, you would instead square boost to the vine, which needs to be from far away or else slide will be too low to attach. Quad jump and cut forward with your final jump to land on top. Making this jump ledgeless is not easy, and doing so is required in order for this to be faster, so the glitch high jump option from the spire is recommended. Head for the stairs and square boost to cut the corner to the left, and then square boost over the water wheel. From the roof, either jump over the ledge and double jump to attach the wall sneak just to the right of the turn in it, or pass the ledge and fall off into the double jump. An easier but slower option would be to go to the ground and single jump to attach from there. From past the bend, you can do a delayed double jump to hit the trigger with square. Optimally, this would instead be a square boost, but this is a costly square boost to miss in terms of time and health. Getting to this trigger without taking damage is strongly recommended and is especially important for newer runners. 
In this job, we have to deliver an explosive barrel to the center of the next room, which is guarded by a series of laser fences and spotlights. The barrel will detonate if it takes any damage, and it kills Sly if he is in its radius, even if he has iframes. From the cutscene, stealth slide toward the barrel and single jump into it. If we leave the barrel, it blows up after a few seconds. But if we jump out and immediately do a mid-air cane swing to hit the barrel, we can cause it to explode immediately and also not kill us. This is not a square boost, and it's also not just pressing square after X. It needs to be square immediately after X. This can be done by sliding your thumb quickly from X to square. It's extremely important that you aren't moving at all when you do this trick, as Sly can clip out the side of the barrel. This can either miss the swing completely, or it can kill you. Or, Sly could be pushed into a laser fence. When you stop moving on your stick, the barrel will continue to move for a brief moment while Sly stops. So we strongly recommend taking your thumb off the left stick completely and waiting a brief moment before doing it. Then get the new barrel. Wait until it is on the ground before jumping to it, as the mouth of the dispenser can block us. The barrel can move around from Sly touching it, so if you get it stuck underneath the dispenser and can't get in, just run against the side of it to push it free. Bring the barrel to the second laser fence, avoiding the lasers on the way. If struggling with the barrel strat, you can just jump out and let the barrels explode normally. After the second fence explodes, optimally you would square boost beyond the lasers, but you have to be fast and angle well to avoid the vertical lasers. So alternatively, you can glitch high jump. Note that these cycles will be different on other versions. In the next hall, avoid the three spotlights. Each one swings from side to side faster than the previous. Swing twice to break two objects as you round the corner. This clears a more optimal line for walking the barrel later. Then, depending on the cycles and the fences, you can either go under them, square boost over them, or do a normal jump over them. These cycles begin from when you load into this area at the beginning of the job and are completely consistent, so if you do the same movement every time, they will be the same. They will continue to run throughout the rest of the job and will come into play again when we're back with a barrel. Square boost into a Binocucom cutscene past the line in the floor. Taking some damage up until the cutscene isn't the end of the world, but the main room, where we will need to tank some damage, will be safer with more health. If you're having trouble with the upcoming parts of this job, or if you have already taken some damage, just take it safe and ensure you don't take any more. This job is no checkpoint, so you have to be cautious. A faster strat for the first section abuses iframes to get beyond the floor lasers to the right laser fence. To do this, first spam stealth slide into the barrel to push it into the wall, and then hug the wall to move along and push the barrel alongside you. Take damage, then single jump immediately so that slide jumps backwards and lands in the barrel while still facing toward the laser, and walk through it with your iframes. You don't have a lot of time to work with here, so the barrel needs to be fairly close and you need to avoid a turnaround animation. Then hug the wall to dodge the moving laser and walk into the corner. Depending on your speed, you may need to wait for the cycle to pass. From the corner, do two space taps of the analog stick back right, and then do the detonation strat. But ensure the barrel is not intersecting with the moving laser, or you'll die, and make sure to space out the taps at least a little bit. With this strat, you gain a more direct path to the cutscene, which would save over 7 seconds in a vacuum, but the laser fence cycles toward the end of the job limit the potential time save to a max of about 5 seconds on Korean, if we assume optimal play. It also results in two hits of damage, which is problematic for reasons we'll discuss in a bit. We definitely don't recommend this strat, but it does exist. In the main room, there are four guards. One guard on the upper level pans his light back and forth across the area we need to walk a barrel through, and the other circles the grinder. Another two circle the lower level in opposite directions. The upper circling guard spawns in a consistent spot when you are between the two moving laser fences, and he freezes when you're in the cutscene. This means your quickness to pass the second laser fence would affect his position. The lower guards are teleported to scripted positions and facing angles for the cutscene, and then turn and walk a few seconds after it concludes. To walk a barrel safely and quickly to the grinder, we need to get rid of at least the guy panning his light on top and the bottom guard closest to the cutscene. From the cutscene, hold forward and slightly right. Square boost across and then hit the right guard once to knock him off the ledge. Immediately switch back left and fall off the upper level to on top of the closer guard. Hit him as you're falling, and then juggle him with timed uppercuts while continuing to move forward. Bring him as far as you can, then stand beside the panel against the wall, or you can stand right in front of the panel. By letting the guards shoot us, we can get them to break the fence quite easily, which saves us a trip with the barrel. Once the fence is dead, kill the guard you hit already. If you have hit the guard fewer than three times, you will need a double hit. 
Unless you also hit the other guard three times, there's no reason to kill him, and it's not normally any safer to do so, so you can leave him alive. Hitting flashlight guards triggers the reflex attack, which is really dangerous in close quarters. An uppercut can help you avoid hitting the other guard, but if he's unconscious, this will just juggle him and won't execute. After killing the guard, head to the barrel across the room. The one guard left alive will shoot you once. It's incredibly rare to avoid this shot in a way that isn't slower anyways, so this damage should always be expected. Upon reaching the barrel, the guards will usually lose you. If you did everything right, they definitely will. If you killed the proper guard, this route will be clear, but if you killed the wrong one, you can go the other way. If you miss a square boost across the gap, you can use this pipe to get back to the top with two double jumps. There are several ways to return to the top level in this room, but this is definitely the best. To avoid getting shot while jumping, you may want to abuse iframes by taking a shot first. A completely easy option would be the intended climbable pipe to the left after falling. But because of the guard cycles, it's faster to just deal with the lower level first if you fall by mistake. Killing both bottom guards in this case would be ideal, or else you'd probably have to wait during the barrel movement. If you're quick, the top guards may be grouped, and you can hit them both off and continue to the barrel. Done well, this backup only loses about a second, but the cycles later on can amplify or negate the time loss. Alternatively, you can glitch high jump in place of the square boost, but it's important to be quick to avoid an issue arising from the circling guard spotting you too soon. There's a bit of randomness to the circling guard, since he will randomly stop and start. For dealing with the lower level, we abuse iframes heavily, but this can only get us so far. With the normal strat, it's important to hit the closer guard twice at absolute minimum before going to the fence, and it's also very important to maximize your health up until this point. This strat takes 3 eighths of your health at minimum, and that's only with optimal play and if everything goes to plan. If for example you took water damage in the hub and got hit by a laser once in the first hall, that would place you at 50% health and with no room for error, since an additional unplanned hit would kill you, and remember this job has no checkpoints. So if you are at 50% health and not confident you can do this perfectly, or in any event where you're below 50% health, you'd want to do an alternative strat and get a healther. Health drops in Sly 2 are not random, and instead function based on an invisible counter, tracking how many objects you destroy or guards you kill. Breakable objects count as 1 point each, and guards count as 2 points each. When the counter reaches 7, a healther will drop 50% of the time. If it reaches 8, a healther will drop 100% of the time. The counter resets to zero whenever a healther drops, and also resets to zero when the game is reset. The counter is maintained through area loads and file loads, even if it isn't the same file. Some objects and guards don't drop anything at all, but these still increment the counter. If one of these would normally cause a healther to drop, the counter will still act as if it did and reset to zero, effectively skipping the healther. But the only relevant place where this can occur in Spice Grinder is this pot on the lower level, and the snake on the upper level. If on the center island you hit the first guard off and stealth slide around to stealth slam the other one, you would be guaranteed a healther from the guard on the ground. However, this would change if you break any superfluous objects or kill additional guards since the reset before Blow the Dam. In Blow the Dam, we don't break anything, so the counter stays at zero. In Spice Grinder, the two objects in the hall give us two points. The three guard kills give us six, equaling eight in total and guaranteeing a healther. With only the other guard remaining with this backup, use him to break the fence and then avoid him like normal on your way to the barrel. Once in the barrel, walk past the broken fence and keep left. Avoid the spotlights and lasers. Since dying would result in a massive time loss, it's better to be safe than sorry. For the spotlights, remember that they won't shoot you in the barrel if you are still but also remember that it takes a brief moment for the barrel to stop. As you approach the end, the guards circling the grinder will usually be alive if you did the optimal strat. It's rarely necessary, but make sure to avoid his light. Sometimes, when he is lured toward the lower level during the earlier activities, he'll be on his way back to his post and you might have to wait behind him. Once in the spice, single jump normally to finish the job. Be very careful to avoid the grind wheel. The front of it deals damage, and the job will only complete if we walk the barrel in and jump out purposefully. After the job complete screen, load the game. From the load, mash to select Sly again, and we'll head to Needless Secret. This time, square boost off forward and to the left to land on this platform. 
Avoid bonking on the branch that blocks part of the safe house's opening. Head across and square boost over the rope and then again over the roots. If you miss the square boost over the gap, just press circle to attach to the vine. If you fall to the ground, you can reach the vine with a glitch high jump and single jump off. Square boost over the path and then off the roof. Square boost onto the elevated area with the job trigger to enter it. There's no need to square boost into the trigger directly since there's no Binocucom animation. This job is another Nila auto scroller where we'll farm coins, so it's very similar to Moonlight Rendezvous from episode 1. While trying to farm, we need to stay close enough to Nila so that she doesn't stop to wait for us. You might remember that we mentioned Nila would do brief pauses if you're too close to her, and this mechanic is a lot more relevant here, so try to balance some separation while still remaining in range. There is also a new mechanic to consider while Nila is crossing a rail walk. Getting close to her will cause her to sprint across faster, so we can jump alongside her to save frames. This was also possible in Moonlight Rendezvous, but there's no way to implement this in that job while farming the same amount. Here the coins are still the priority, but there are some opportunities for the rope strap. Although using stealth slide is unnecessary for most of this auto scroller, it can be used to catch up a bit when you've fallen behind and feel that you're right on the edge of Nila's range. After the cutscene, wait in place for a moment since the job begins within Nila's range where she will do pauses. Then head towards the vine. If there's a guard in front of it, you can spin through their coins, but other guards should be ignored so as to not waste time. Farm the brick above the vine, then head toward Nila and jump over her while she's on the rope. Be careful to not attach in front of her, since that can get her stuck behind Sly or make Sly fall. Once she's on the platform, we want some distance again. On the far end of the platform, farm this breakable and follow Nila across the bridge. To the right, farm the barrel, then go further right to farm two bricks. Square boost or glitch high jump across to farm this breakable, and then go up to farm another on the roof. After the coins, follow Nila to the roof where we got the third melon in leading Rajan. Near this building, there's often a flashlight guard. Nila will kill him if he's close, but sometimes you may have to avoid him yourself. You can always tank damage on the ground and then use your iframes to get to the roof but this may require you to sacrifice the object on the roof to keep up with Neela. For this object, in any scenario, you may have to wait a moment to swing if Neela's still nearby. The triangle attack can be used if you want, since it can't hurt her, but you'd probably just end up swinging and spinning anyways. This roof sometimes has a small guard, so be prepared for some coins if Neela kills them. If you're able, you can go for the rope strap for the beginning of the long rope, but oftentimes coin farming prevents this, and you need to be really careful to avoid falling. On the far end of the rope, Nila will often kill a small guard, but they will not drop coins. Run to the far corner in front of the climbing vine and wait for a moment. Once Nila lands on the ground, she reaches a checkpoint of sorts, and you're good to head left to farm a breakable near the mushroom. Drop down and double jump forward in midair to continue to follow Nila. It's important to replicate this movement closely and to not jump from the roof or else Nila will stop. If decently separated from Nila when getting off the rope, you can just run near the corner and head to the breakable immediately without waiting. Attempt to beat Nila to the stairs like this and then farm the two objects from Waterbug Run. Nila will hit the pot and it won't drop any coins if she beats you to it. Triangle attacks would be recommended until Nila has passed to avoid hitting her. Nila can also kill a guard that may spawn here dropping additional coins. With two jumps using the elephant water spout you can reach the upper level quicker which may help you farm more coins. Either jump can be a double jump or glitch high jump but only a glitch high jump can make the second jump ledgeless which gives you more of a time cushion. This movement isn't necessary and can be a little tricky, and missing it repeatedly can lead to a job fail. Farm objects while following Nila toward and then up the stairs, but be careful to gauge your distance. After glitch high jumping up the stairs, a flashlight guard can potentially be a complication on the top level while you follow Nila to the large bridge. Sometimes Nila will run by him which attracts him. If this happens you can stealth slide around and hit him, or you could just tank a shot from him. This takes longer, so make sure you use Stealth Slide to catch up to Nila. On the bridge itself, you can coast with Stealth Slide since it's just barely slanted downwards. Alternatively, you can keep along the edge to avoid the guard, but be very careful that you don't get hit off this level. But if you do get hit off or you fall, you can use the same object from one of Waterbug Run's backups to get to the bridge. Near the pool with the lily pads, head over to the bouncy pad to bounce up to the roof, then drop down. This part is often pretty relaxed since Nila takes forever to cross the pool. Follow Nila across the bridge to the end of this section. We recommend just single or double jumping to cross the gaps. Square boosting is an unnecessary risk and you shouldn't need them to keep up. 
To end the auto-scroller, you need to at least stand even with the ruin on the left after the final gap. At the end of this job, we want a coin total between 224 and 259 if we are on the super early smoke bomb route, and between 300 and 315 if we're on the late smoke bomb route. The next section consistently gets 13 coins, so you can adjust by 13 to check your coins more easily at the end of the auto-scroller. Inside, after the cutscene, we need to pickpocket the keys from two guards. The first has two clumps of coins, and the second has just one. First, stealth slide toward the left guard and do a delayed double jump over his light on the right side. You can either land on the railing or on the ground to the left of the railing. Do not glitch high jump here, since that would break part of the railing and make noise. Pickpocket the guard using R1 tapping or a tap of stealth slide. R1 tapping is safer depending on proximity since the guard can randomly stop or start. Like with the fifth guard and lower the drawbridge, there's a chance Sly will fall out of his crouching stealth state behind this guard, presumably because of a bugged spot. So if you hold forward and press circle to pickpocket and this occurs, Sly won't pickpocket and you'll just walk into the guard. This area has at least one spot where this can occur, so be very cautious. After pickpocketing, R1 tap if the guard continues to move until you can safely square boost to the ramp. If the guard stops or is stopped, just stealth slam him or you could be stuck waiting for a bit. From the ramp, square boost onto the sprinkler platform closest to the guard and glitch high jump to behind him. Be careful to not hit square for your glitch high jump too soon since a mid-air cane swing could cause you to slide off the platform toward the water below. It's possible to double jump instead of glitch high jumping, but this isn't really worth it. When landing behind the guard, be careful to not press circle too soon or you could super sneaky to the rail walks or spires far below. If this happens, you could super jump off like in lower the drawbridge. But if you're stuck down here, get to the vine from Spice Room Recon and use this movement to return to the top. If spotted at any point, use Smoke Bomb if you have it. But if not, and you're spotted with zero keys, it's probably best to just kill one of the guards and start over after the job fail. If you get spotted with one key, kill the guard you already looted and do your best to get away from the other one. After pulling the second key, stealth slide down the ramp to the lock, then release stealth slide to press circle. After the cutscene, hold right and very slightly back, spam stealth slide a bit up the ramp, square boost, and spam again. Near the top, also spam circle. Spamming stealth slide all the way breaks even, but if you're comfortable with square boosting, using one can serve some juice. This ramp is weird, so this small bit of movement does defy some of the guidelines we established for using stealth slide. Grabbing the heart completes the job. From here, we will not immediately proceed to the next job, and will instead return a treasure first. From the job complete screen, hold up left and stealth slide down the ramp. Square boost to cut the corner, and square boost again into the exit. Since there's a lot of verticality to this room, the corner cut can be punishing if you miss the square boost. So you can alternatively just wrap around and coast all the way until the square boost. After loading back to the hub, stealth slide to the left and square boost to attach to the vine. Like the alternative route in Waterbug Run, we can ledge grab the roof with glitch high jump, or use a quad jump to make it ledgeless and save just over half a second. Continue to the treasure, Gilded Scepter. You can spam circle to try to pick it up as soon as possible, but Sly can't pick it up during an active stealth slide. Cut right and slightly back and then square boost down to the lower roof and again to ground level. From the slight slope in the ground, we can reach the vine above with a glitch high jump. Single jump cane swing immediately to detach onto the roof. At the far end, square boost or glitch high jump to cross the gap double jump to this structure beside the building, and glitch high jump to reach the roof. This mushroom doesn't need a jump to get it to bounce us, so just stealth slide into it and fall normally without a double jump or a cane swing to reach the safe house door. To enter the safe house optimally, you must account for the position at which Sly opens the door in his animation. If you land or stand exactly on that spot and press circle, Sly can immediately enter, but if you're elsewhere in front of the door, Sly needs to move before he can open it. This applies to any character with any safe house, with the exception of episode 2. It also applies to some other interactable things in the rest of the game, but it has seldom been relevant up to this point. In the safe house, we need to sell the treasure and then buy turnbuckle. Go left twice to the thief net, select it, then go right to sell one treasure with a single press. Return to the left menu, and go down three times to double click turnbuckle launch, which is the second of the Murray gadgets which cost 400 coins. Do not buy the first one, which is Fist of Flames. Buy the second one. If you mistakenly bought Fist of Flames, you'll need to load and get the treasure again. 
The route to Gilded Scepter from the safe house is practically the same as the route to the next job trigger, so it'll be self-explanatory. After exiting the thief net, go right twice to select Sly. While the vast majority of Rip Off the Ruby is a Murray job, Sly starts it, so make sure to remember that. Square boost off upright, glitch high jump to the spire, and again to the climbable vine. Immediately single jump, and then make it to the bridge with a double jump and a glitch high jump. The glitch high jump needs to be curled to avoid bonking on the ribbed wall. Frames can be saved by instead double jumping from the vine onto the closest part of the stairs and square boosting to the floor with the mushroom. On the bridge, square boost twice up the hill, then coast down it. Square boost up the stairs and then double jump to land at the base of the slope. From here, we will perform a slope jump to reach the job trigger. A square boost can be used to reach the tusk slightly more optimally, but it can be awkward and tricky to get over the railing. The tusk's odd terrain also restricts your movement on the ground, so it's better to land in the proper spot for the slope jump from the air, and the double jump is very comfortable. Do a double jump slope jump directly into the slope, and another one immediately after it. Jump normally out of the second slope jump to reach the top. If you find yourself slipping off to the left, you can spam circle to try to attach to this vine. If you fall all the way down, use this route to do a slope jump from the side, similar to the alternative route in Waterbug Run. This side would be optimal without the treasure, and is easier than slope jumping from the optimal position at the front of the elephant. So if you're struggling with the standard one, you can just jump over or jump to the rope and do it from the side. From here, the top can be reached with a double jump slope jump, a couple quick bursts of stealth slide, and a double jump. The stealth slide cancels the charge attack and gives free movement sooner, but if it's more comfortable, you can also do a slope jump and a glitch high jump out of it. From the optimal position, you can do one slope jump and a glitch high jump, but this is somewhat precise. Sly needs enough height to get to the top without a ledge grab, without getting too close to the slope to do another slope jump. Optimally, this slope jump is cancelled with stealth slide to begin the glitch high jump slightly earlier. Once to the top, just stealth slide into the trigger, don't square boost. There is no fast way to this job trigger without the use of a slope jump, so do whatever is the most comfortable and consistent for you. This is currently the only place in any percent where a slope jump saves enough to be considered a required trick. After the cutscene, we'll be facing the ruby from in front of it. We can dislodge it using four whacks of arcane, but it's elevated to where we need to jump in order to hit it. By hitting triangle then X very quickly, we can perform a glitch jump called a triangle jump. This has very little application in the game, but it's extremely useful here. Like Bentley's bomb boost, you need to use two fingers and claw grip, but it's important that you hit X very shortly after triangle. Hitting both at the exact same time would result in a spiral dive. By doing a triangle jump and then hitting square immediately after it, we can do two aerial swings of the cane back to back with a single jump. So after the cutscene, do this twice to dislodge the ruby. Depending on where exactly Sly is positioned following the cutscene, or if you've moved from bonking on the structure, you may need to move Sly a little bit. After the ruby falls, we'll control Murray for the rest of the job. From the cutscene, optimally you would hold upright and run through this gap in the teeth. Murray will bonk on the right tooth, and we want to punch between when he bonks and when he runs off the ledge to do a punch boost. Alternatively, you can head more to the right and punch boost more simply through this gap. As Murray is falling, release R1 and equip turnbuckle to either L1, L2, or R2. We'd recommend L1. This is the only Murray gadget we'll buy in full game, so you don't need to consider other gadgets. Turnbuckle launch allows Murray to do a jump of much greater height, which you can follow up with a normal double jump. When turnbuckle is held, Murray stops completely and enters this ridiculous animation where he prepares to jump. If you release it, he'll do nothing, but if you hit X while in this state, you'll get the larger jump. Turnbuckle is always the same height, the animation has no impact. However, because it stops Murray, this forces a jump from a complete standstill, limiting the potential distance that the jump could cover. But this doesn't happen if you press the button at the same time as X or very shortly before X. With a running start and the two inputs close together, the launch maintains a lot of horizontal momentum and can cover greater distances. This is the technique we will use throughout the run for turnbuckle. If you attempt this and just get a normal jump, it's because your turnbuckle and X inputs were too spaced from each other. You only need to press turnbuckle, but holding the button can save you from doing a normal jump if your timing is just slightly off. But when holding, the X input would still need to be very early in the turnbuckle animation to get sufficient momentum. From the edge of this roof, turnbuckle and double jump in order to ledge grab the upper level, and double jump again to get up. This saves having to run all the way across the map, so this jump is really important. The jump can be started from and aimed toward anywhere along these lines. But for aiming, keep in mind that you're doing this jump partially blind since you'd have to fight with the camera to see the ledge. It's important to avoid the bulbous object on the railing, which forms the right end of where you should be aiming, since that can prevent Murray from being able to ledge grab. Because the upper ledge and lower edge are angled in opposite directions, different spots for either side of the jump will affect how much you need to extend it. 
At some angles, you don't need to extend it at all. This jump can be a bit of a struggle for beginners, but if you get a hang of the optimal technique with turnbuckle, it really isn't bad. If you fall to the ground, just turnbuckle back to the roof and retry. But remember, you need a running start. On the upper level, head up the ramp and toward the tusk. With turnbuckle, as long as you do the technique we discussed, Murray can get onto it easily. This is possible but precise with a single jump from turnbuckle, but just do a double jump. Like Sly's tusk jump, you won't make it if you bonk on the tusk immediately after jumping, but this is really easy to avoid if you just jump earlier. There's a cutscene in the area around the ruby, but we can skip it by breaking the ruby with a thunder flop. Single jump over the seam in the tusk, but make sure to keep left in order to avoid the trigger. Do a little turn so Murray has momentum in the proper direction, turn buckle to over the ruby, and hit square or triangle to thunder flop. Murray will hit the cutscene and then break the ruby, failing the job and skipping the cutscene. This trigger is weird, so be generous and make sure you don't get too close to the area with the ruby until you're jumping to do the skip. The cutscene skip can also be done from the top of the stairs, where you don't need to turn buckle, but this is a little slower. Mash X through the job fail. In the next section, we need to deliver the ruby to two locations without the ruby taking any damage. The journey to the first location is rather simple. From the load, mash circle to stop and grab the ruby as soon as possible. Turn back right and toss it to the cushion. Then single jump and run to beyond it to pick it up again. Since we can't run while holding something, we want to try to run past each of the cushions in this job and pick up the ruby from as close to max range as we can. Being any further would just cause you to stomp, so it's best to be a bit on the safe side. With the ruby, walk directly across the bridge. Once you hit the Bentley trigger indicated by him walking toward the door, adjust your line to head toward the right side of the gate. It's not possible to get hit by Bentley's bomb, so just keep going. When heading up the stairs, Bentley will be coming up behind, and he can push us, potentially leading to damage and a job fail. So respect his space and wait for him to pass. This doesn't lose any time since Bentley determines our speed in this specific part. Once Bentley deploys the cushion past the gap, toss, jump, and run to the left of the ruby, then pick it up and throw again. For each cushion, you can press the button to throw as soon as it appears, as long as you're close enough to hit it. Again, go past the ruby to pick it up from further. The max range for this cushion is here. Then walk and toss as soon as the cushion is deployed. To cross the gap, either punch boost double jump, or just run off and do a double jump. The punch boost option only saves a few frames. Just past the structure on the left, pick up the ruby and throw it to the cushion once below the archway. Here we reach a cutscene and also a checkpoint. Afterward, step toward the ruby and grab it. In this section, we want to GSM, so keep your camera pointed in this direction to start. For the time being, Bentley determines our speed, as long as we continue to hit triggers where Bentley stops to see if Murray is still following. To prevent Bentley from getting stuck, don't rush and just follow behind him until he jumps from the roof. On the ground level, head this way and turn your camera to the right and head up the slope. If you drop down from the roof and Bentley is stuck on this ledge, move back to around this area to try to hit the trigger. If you somehow cannot get him unstuck, you'd have to yeet the ruby and fail the job, since you can't proceed without Bentley. Near the top, you can turn your camera to be normal horizontally, but you want it aimed as far down as possible to prevent or minimize guard spawns on the roof in front of you. Wait beside the tree. By having the area beside the rail walk on the next roof in frame, you can see the cushion when it's deployed. Throw the ruby, then turn buckle across the gap. Alternatively, you can fall to the ground and turn buckle up, which effectively breaks even. When Murray reaches the roof, a guard will always spawn from the doorway, and a new one will spawn to replace him if you kill him, so you're always going to be alerted which will attract the attention of every guard on the map. There's no way to get rid of that, so we just have to take the ruby and deliver it safely. Don't try to fight, at least not here. With smart movement, and sometimes smart camera movement in the form of guard attack manipulation, or GAM, you can fairly easily and safely throw the ruby to the next roof. Like we discussed in episode 1 with Silence the Alarms, guards cannot melee attack when they are off screen, but placing them off screen will also cause them to move to try to get back into frame, so preventing them from attacking here is not always inherently safer. Although Murray is slow in carrying, guard attacks can often just be walked past since the guard stops to complete an animation before attacking. The guard on the first roof shouldn't be an issue for throwing the ruby to the second, but be wary of the guard on the second roof if you got a spawn there. Bentley can also block your throw to this cushion if you throw too far from the left. After tossing, turn buckle and run past the ruby to grab it. This final throw is the scariest since guards will be swarming and they can block it from the cushion. Oftentimes it's rather comfortable to just pick up the ruby, aim it, and toss it, but other times you may have to move a bit first to get a clear throwing lane. You have to use your best judgment, but if you wait too long to throw, the situation with the guards might get out of control, so throw it as soon as you safely can. 
If you mess up the movement and are surrounded by guards as a result, don't pick up the ruby, and try to lead them away first so they don't kill it while trying to attack you. Bend them off, but be careful because an errant punch from Murray would also kill the ruby. Ridiculously, the guards rocks, which they throw when a character is inaccessible to them, and which deal a tiny sliver of damage, will fail the job if they hit the ruby. This is really rare, with only a few reported instances of this happening. He tossed a rock! <laughs> but jumping more to the left of the ruby may help to avoid this possibility. <laughs> Reaching the second cutscene with the ruby completes the job. Reset the game to skip a Bentley slideshow. After the reset, mash circle or X to select Murray for the operation. We begin with the same movement options as rip off the ruby. From the lower roof, do what is essentially the same jump with turnbuckle from earlier, except to the right side. You can be given your jump from the roof's edge anywhere between these two points. Ledge grab the right side of the upper railing while avoiding the bulbs and double jump up. Cross the bridge closest to the safe house. If you turn buckle far enough to the right, you can reach the bridge directly from the ledge grab, but if you're too far to the right, Murray's ability to ledge grab seems inconsistent, so this can be somewhat precise. On the bridge, double jump from the hole to land on the post. Immediately punch boost off toward the job trigger. If you're spotted, just run off instead of punch boosting, since Murray's auto-targeting can send him in a different direction than expected. It could even send you back to the lower level, so make sure to be aware. Run to the trigger and punch into it. This is the first time we get to punch into a trigger as Murray. Punch late enough where the stop animation after it doesn't have a chance to play. Like with most movement-based punches, only do so if you aren't spotted. From the cutscene, hold down left, but keep the camera pointed in this direction to GSM. Punch boost backwards off the upper level and then head through the tunnel. Sometimes there's a guard on the lower level near where you drop down. It isn't really a big deal if he hits you, but he can usually be avoided with a clean punch boost. As you exit the tunnel, you can turn your camera to normal. Cut the corner with a single jump. It's optimal to land on the railing and punch boost, but this can be strangely tricky, so don't hit square unless you're sure you're landing on the railing. Cross the bridge, and then four guards will spawn from just inside the door and exit it with a jump, and we need to kill them. After the first guard, it's random how long it takes for each to spawn. When waiting, you can punch the door repeatedly to try to pre-fire a guard and kill them while they're still inside. If a guard is outside, it's generally fastest to use a triangle square combo. We only need to kill the four door guards, so ignore any others. After the fourth guard, run to the lever and interact with it. Sly has a voice line when you've killed all four, if you're unsure. Then we have a turret section where we need to destroy bombs which drop towards Murray. Six bombs initially spawn, and there are 35 in total. Through study of this section, we were unable to confidently determine how the bomb spawning works, but our theory is that bombs randomly spawn above the screen to replace each bomb which has been destroyed. Shoot each bomb as fast as possible. You don't need to aim precisely since you can just sweep across where the bomb is or just beneath it while firing. During downtime while waiting for spawns, you can sweep across the top of the screen for a chance to pre-fire one of the bombs. Zooming a bit with the right stick can make aiming easier since it slows our panning but that can also be a bad thing, so do it minimally, if at all. After the turret section, mash a face button to lift the lever. We then spawn in mid-air as Sly, fall, and run forward to jump into the barrel. Just like in Spice Grinder, we need to wait for a moment for the barrel to fall before we can jump. We need to deliver the barrel to the area where Murray lifted the lever, and we will have our camera backwards for GSM for most of the route. At the start, you can use the dirt to guide you onto the bridge. Once you've crossed, turn diagonally to the left. We will reach a tree. Sly can walk over the first route, but it needs to be at a particular angle to keep him from getting caught on it. So you could also just keep more left and avoid the route. We turn just as the road does, so we're walking straight backwards with the tower near the center of the screen. If you're on a proper line, the fountain will extend out from the left side of the screen, but won't force us to change our path or fix the camera. Adjust slightly to the left after passing the fountain. Alongside the second fountain, you can turn your camera to normal. Cross the bridge and then wrap up to the left. When walking from the grass onto the floor, avoid walking too close to the corner or Sly will get caught on the lip on the ground. Then proceed to the area Murray opened up. Once the barrel is in the water, single jump to exit, which triggers a long cutscene. Afterward, hold upright and glitch high jump to the bridge from the left of the mushroom. 
On the bridge, there are now these large spires, which we are supposed to use to reach the platform where we ripped off the ruby. On the left side of the bridge, just past the lantern structure, you can glitch high jump to attach to the spire in front of Sly, skipping the first half of them. It seems like you need to jump onto the ledge, but you don't, and running makes it easier to get onto it without bonking off the spire beside Sly. The fastest movement to the ledge would look like this, but just running would be fine, since Sly bonks on the spires really easily. On the spires, ideally you would double jump along the left repeatedly and reach the platform. Just like with the rocks in episode 2, Sly's jumps will be inconsistent if he settles on these spires, so it's generally better to jump immediately. Rajan attacks with lightning randomly along the left, center, or right of the spires. He indicates with his staff where he will target, which allows you to prepare for it. If necessary, you can jump to one of the spires to the right to avoid a shot, but tanking one and pressing circle to reattach is fine. Optimally, you would skip all of the spires, using almost identical movement to rip off the ruby, but with the added complication of avoiding the spires. On the tusk, you can reach the trigger with the same slope jump options from earlier, but the camera will go crazy in the middle of it, which can make it more difficult. If you slip off to the left, you'll fall into water and warp back. Keep in mind that the trigger is in front of where the ruby originally was, so you may need to move a little bit on top if you end up past the trigger. Optimally, the slope jump route saves just over 2 seconds, but it also avoids the randomness at play with the lightning. After hitting the trigger, a cutscene leads up to the Rajan boss fight with Murray. In this fight, Rajan has two attacks. The first is a sweep of his staff followed by a slam onto the ground, which he will prioritize in close range. This can be dodged by single jumping over the sweep toward the camera with at least a slight downward move on the left stick. His second attack electrifies all of the water in the area. He uses this when Murray isn't nearby, and it can only be avoided by standing on a lily pad. Either attack can be cancelled by damaging Rajan. Damage is dealt to Rajan every three punches. Unlike Dimitri or guards, it's not a full knockback, just a push, so he has no getup attack and you can attack again pretty much immediately, but so can he. Also unlike with the Dimitri fight, we can feel free to hold R1 even when we're close to Rajan. If Rajan contacts the electric fence, it deals a small chunk of his health in a single hit, and Rajan leaps back to the center of the arena. Most simply, this fight can be completed by repeatedly punching and then single jumping to dodge the sweep attack. Begin the fight by running right to Rajan, punch twice, single jump toward the camera, and then do three punches and a single jump. After the start, repeat the three punches and the single jump as best as you can until Rajan is dead. But remain aware of Rajan's attack animations and don't get trapped in the repetition because sometimes you may have to abandon a punch and single jump after only doing two. If Rajan hits the fence, run to meet him in the center of the arena. After Rajan has lost 25% of his health, he will summon guards to assist him. With this strat, you should pretty much just ignore the guards. You can punch them when you have an opportunity if Rajan's returning to the center from the fence. If you do get hit in the back, it shouldn't be a big deal unless you take a lot of damage from Rajan as well. Rajan can't attack you when you have iframes, so when you take damage you can abuse this to punch more times in a row without the need to jump. Although simple to learn, the punching and jumping strat is rather antiquated and slow. Optimally, you'd instead use thunder flops during Rajan's sweep animation to deal additional damage and also cause him to bounce across the arena, ideally into the electric fence. You'll see from the health bar that the thunder flop can deal damage to Rajan with a single hit as opposed to the three required with a punch. To perform bouncy Rajan consistently, single jump when Rajan is winding up his staff to thunder flop directly down onto the left side of him as he's beginning his sweep. You want Rajan to be in the sweep when your thunder flop connects, but you need to jump a bit earlier to do so. Don't double jump and make sure you aim toward the left side of Rajan's hitbox in our perspective. If you aim too far right, you won't bounce Rajan sufficiently and you may deal less damage. If you aim too far left, the same outcomes may also happen, or you'll just miss. Missing a thunder flop generally means you'll get hit by a Rajan slam attack. When you don't have a perfectly clean thunder flop, and Rajan takes a bit less damage, it will only take one more punch for him to get hit back and take the rest of that set of damage. At the beginning of the fight, hold right to run a couple steps toward Rajan, and then thunder flop. It's pretty hard to get Rajan all the way to the fence with this first flop, so be prepared to run toward him to punch him into the fence. Alternatively, you could begin the fight in the same way as the Solar Strat and begin the Thunder Flops after the first pushback to Rajan. When Rajan contacts the fence and you are close to him, run to the center of the arena and meet him there, and punch him three times immediately when he returns. 
you need to begin your sequence of punches early enough to fit in three, or else you will need a jump to dodge the sweep. If Rajan initiates the electricity attack after returning, instead of the sweep, you have a little additional time to punch him. On Rajan's next attack animation after the pushback from the punches, do the thunderflop again, but ensure he reaches the fence. If he doesn't, and we aren't ready for it by running toward him, he will likely initiate the electricity attack, which slows the fight down and probably results in damage. If near Rajan when he hits the fence, it is possible to thunderflop him again to bounce him right back into it, but this is rather hard and risky. It's very easy to just push Murray into the fence instead, but you get a really quick sequence of damage if you pull it off. When Rajan contacts the fence and you are already in the center of the arena, just prepare for the next cycle while he leaps back. If there are guards, you have a moment to punch them away. Punch Rajan three times when he returns and then repeat with the Thunderflop strat after the first knockback. The rest of the fight is just a repeat of these actions, but it's pretty hard and the guards add a level of variability that you have to adapt to. When you've been hit, remember that Rajan can't attack you due to your iframes, which also means that you can't do the flop strat, so repeatedly punch until Rajan can attack again. If you've been separated from Rajan, usually due to being damaged, and you can't properly time or aim your thunderflop, just switch to punches and single jumping to avoid the sweep until you can thunderflop properly. The thunderflop strat can save around 15 seconds on average with proper execution, with potential for more if it's done really well, but it's pretty hard. If your consistency with the thunderflops isn't good enough to justify doing it, feel free to just do the punching and jumping. Regardless of what you do, this fight can be difficult, and you want to avoid a death here, which the community calls a Rajan choke. If you do die, remember that noob mode, which we discussed in episode 1, slows down boss attacks. This effect scales with different levels of noob mode, so it increases with repeated deaths. Since everything we do here is based around Rajan's animations, noob mode can dramatically alter the fight. With an extreme level of noob mode, it's even possible to just repeatedly punch and never jump. Hopefully this won't come into play in your runs, but it's definitely something to look out for and practice if you die deliberately to do the fight again. When the final hit of damage has been dealt to Rajan, be it from a punch, a thunderflop, or the electric fence, he will complete a 3.93 second long animation where he falls to the ground before the cutscene begins. During this time, it is possible to die, but only if the fatal damage comes very early on in Rajan's falling animation. Once the final hit has been dealt, there's nothing you can do to make it go faster, so you can jump or turnbuckle to try to avoid guards if you want or need. The community standard for splitting is when the final hit has been dealt to Rajan, which also concludes the episode. But if it's more comfortable, you could alternatively split when the cutscene begins. This cutscene is lengthy, but when we reach the job complete screen, if it's faster to do so on your setup, reset the game to skip the outro cutscene in the same way we discussed with the other episodes. After resetting the game or watching the cutscene, we'll be put in the episode menu, where we can continue to episode 4, which we'll do in the next part of this series. Thanks so much for watching. In the description is a link to the Sly Speedrunning Discord, where you can direct questions, seek additional resources, and get help with anything you might struggle with. Remember to like and subscribe, check out Gandhi's links in the description, and all that other sell it stuff, and we'll see you next time.